more and more you hear real estate investors saying, oh, nothing's affordable. I can't find rehabs. I can't get a good deal, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm thinking, wow, I have so many options here. Do you want them? You know, think differently. Think outside of three bedroom, two bath, 1500 square feet. And don't think big apartments. You know, just think the small things that are right available right in front of you. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 361. Today, we're going to discuss affordable housing and how to create more of it. Over 10% of the U.S. population lives in poverty and struggles to afford necessities such as housing. Over the past decade, our nation has not made any real progress in reducing the number of Americans at risk of homelessness. And this has led to a dire need for solutions that increase availability of affordable housing options. Now, there is an opportunity for small business real estate investors, rehabbers, and wholesalers to use small-scale development to increase affordable housing while increasing their profits and helping their community. My guest today is Michelle Williams, also known as Dr. Tiny. She advocates for small-scale development and is on a mission to impact all 3,100 counties in the United States through legislation and policies to increase our affordable housing stock by 2031. Michelle, welcome to the show. Great. Thanks for having me. Dr. Tiny, affordable housing, small scale development. We've got a lot to talk about today. Tell us why you're called Dr. Tiny and what you're all about. I love tiny houses and I love small scale development. And I have a PhD in public policy. And I was given that name by the Tiny House Industry Association. Okay, Tiny Home Industry Association, that's what it is. Okay, and I find that people, single investors, can impact affordable housing through using different technologies such as small-scale development or even tiny house, tiny house communities to affect the, that population that works that are housing insecure to keep them from moving on to homelessness. And so I was given that name, Dr. Tiny, because there's policies and procedures and ordinances that prohibit us from doing that to help out. Let's start with the problem. What is the problem? I can tell you I was in Seattle and Portland last year. I've been in some of the bigger cities. You see a lot of unhoused people living on the streets. Is this the problem you're trying to solve? Yes, and no. So there's two different populations. There's a homeless population. And there's the people that work that can't afford housing near where their employment is, their schooling, their play, and their praying. And so if you can, my, my goal is if you can impact those people that work, that have a salary to be able to afford housing, they won't shift into homelessness. So, and in that population, there are the people that are called Alice, asset limited, income restricted, and employed. So those are the people that make too much money for supplementation, but not enough money to get subsidies. So it puts people, and that's a population that we really don't talk about too much. There is the working poor, and then there's the poor that make, the people that make too much money to be assisted. And and that's the population. Those two populations are what I focus on to keep them out of homelessness. And homelessness, it's not that I don't care about that or don't think about that. It's that for me personally, it requires too many wraparound services for my expertise to help. Yeah. If you can prevent them from 
getting into that situation in the first place, that seems like the best place to, to help the problem. I gave a few numbers in the beginning, but what are the statistics that we need to be aware of, of the, those, the, the Alice type population that you just mentioned? So the United Way did some studies and they do a national study and then they partner with a few states to really break it down into statistics. So now, and I'm going to talk nationally because each state Their statistics are different, but their issues are the same. So it's not only a lack of housing and availability of housing, but it's the options that people don't have. And people become, they call what affordable housing is, is that people only have to spend 30% or less on housing so that they have money to spend on other necessities like food, kids' clothes, schooling, et cetera. So what the goal is, is to either decrease the cost of housing so that people can afford it, or do you increase salaries, but then there's a whole unintended consequences of whatever policy that you choose. So how do you create housing for those people that work with the existing property and land and policies that we have, and what are those policies that we can shift? So when you talk about statistics, like 50% of people are housing insecure or that spend more than 30% or even 35% on housing. That's a, a lot of people. And they have to decide, do I pay the rent or the mortgage? Or do I let my kid's dental issue go away, you know, get worse? Do I not fix the car? You know, they have to make these decisions. So if we can fix the 30% or under with affordable housing that people can afford. And I hate to use the word affordable housing, because when you say that to certain people, their mind goes to homelessness, section eight subsidy and whatever. And that's not what I'm saying. The simple definition of affordable housing is just how much people can afford, that their salaries allow them to afford. Solutions to create more affordable housing, because that sounds like what you're focusing on is let's create more of that affordable or attainable housing so that you can alleviate this issue. And what are some of those solutions that you're working on? So I always tell people to look what's already in your backyard. So because of the 19... 40s, 1950 policies, what single family houses became the norm. And those single families can be on a quarter of an acre, half an acre, or an acre, depending on what the zoning is. What if you were to allow accessory dwelling units in somebody's backyard? And what if the owner of that property, if for, because of, of COVID, went into forbearance? And now we're coming out of COVID already out of it. And that person didn't get that same job back, or maybe they're still unemployed and now they can't meet their mortgage. So now we're on the road for that owner to go into foreclosure. What if you can rent some of their land, the land that they own by an accessory dwelling unit for 300, 400 bucks a month? That's what the homeowner might need just to keep them in their houses. So utilizing what you already have and it, accessory dwelling units is a whole nother conversation, but that's one. Number two is what are the properties that cities or counties own that might be non-conforming? They might not be able to put a three bedroom, two bath, 1500 square foot on there, but could they put three or four, 400 square foot properties in a townhouse model, say, on that property? Are there churches that own property that is just sitting there they don't know what to do with? Can the community come together to create something small for those people that work that can support the community and raise everyone up? So really, I look for opportunities that can bring the entire community up by just creating affordable housing because housing is everyone's issue. Whether you're a NIMBY or a YIMBY, yes, in my backyard or not in my backyard, it affects everybody. It it affects jobs, safety, community effect, et cetera. 
It's really about looking at land differently. Like what land is out there that you might've said, well, that's just a parking lot. Well, now we can turn it into maybe a small, small home development. I was just on a developer bus tour in the city of Grand Rapids last week. And one of the things that they said was that any parking lot that the city owns is in play for the right type of development. I'm in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Just like many other communities, we have this this housing problem. Not enough housing. Rents are are through the roof right now. We need to create more density. We need to create more housing. And the, the solutions that you're talking about are all on the table. You mentioned accessory dwelling units, which is basically if you have a house and then you got enough land in the backyard, you can put a, a small house back there. Is that basically what you're talking about? There's several different ways to do tiny ADUs. One is if you had a garage, to, can you put a upstairs apartment up there? Another one is if you have an extra room in a certain area of your house that you can have a different entrance for somebody. Another one is perhaps a garage that you already have. Can you convert that to a home? And of course, there's the tiny house on wheels that you can, if someone owns that, they can, you know, just wheel it back there. Or if you, you want to purchase one of those to have it as a, as a rental. And then, of course, there's basement conversions into, into housing, rental housing. And that's just one area. ADUs are low, what well, I see as low hanging fruit. And the other low hanging fruit is think about all the boomers who bought five bedroom, three bath houses. And all their kids are gone and their grandkids don't want to live in that area. And now mom's 85 years old and doesn't need assisted living, but needs a little bit of help with grocery shopping or cleaning the car or whatever. Why can't she start renting out those rooms like in a co-housing model to some of the younger single people that can help her out and help themselves out? So that's a, another approach that Sometimes our ordinances for both ADUs and, say, a co-housing model don't support for one reason or another. Do you see that happening often, like empty nester living on their own in a large house, bringing in another family or another group that might be strangers to some extent to live with them? Yeah. So I live in Lewis, Delaware. So it's a resort population. I'm sure you've heard it in the news recently. Rehoboth is just the town next door. And there's a lot of big houses there. And it now has become a real, you know, people bought 35 years ago, 40 years ago, their housing stock, it's old. It might need some repairs, but the owner is too old to make those repairs, but they could not, the owner could not at this point afford to move out. And where are they going to move to? There's nothing affordable and small for them. So why not convert your home into an opportunity for someone else to move in so that they can help you with all you know the owner with all the expenses or the upkeep or et cetera, as well as helping themselves. So yeah, I see that a lot, especially in, you know, in the 70-year-old owner age group and those houses which were there may be 35, 40 years old. It's an interesting form of house hacking for someone who would maybe seek out one of those older owners who's looking for that type of situation so that they would have maybe a place to live and take care of possibly rehab while they're living there. Exactly. And perhaps down the line, it might even be a co-ownership situation so that when the mom dies, I'm just saying the mom, that person might not have any more family left. And now they, you know, they have so much to give the older generation. They're so not knowledgeable and wise not all of them want to go live in a senior center situation. So it, it allows so much opportunity for to use our current stock and upgrade our current stock to make it affordable for families or singles. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about green property management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then green property management can help you take a holistic approach 
approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property manager interested in applying Green Property Management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. If you're thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is healthcare for you and your family. When I made this transition myself, I found the whole healthcare insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB and Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best healthcare options. And best of all, his services are covered by the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at rcbassociatesllc.com. Talk directly to our listeners who are investors and possibly rehabbers, wholesalers, flippers. How should they be thinking differently along the lines that you're talking in order to help solve this problem? The reason why I focus on that is because I was one of those investors that did just a couple rehabs a year and a lot of wholesaling. In fact, I even had a coaching program for wholesalers, just regular people that wanted to learn how to improve their financial situation through real, through real estate investing and wholesaling. But what I did was I realized that I can do that till the cows come home and I'm not making a dent in my community. How can I help my community through the skills that I have as a mom and pop company that does just a few you know, rehabs or whatever a year? So I didn't realize that market of affordable housing or inaffordable housing until I started networking with people in my community and listening to the situation. And this happened over a a wide variety of years. And I realized, what can I do to impact that? And so just through conversations, not talking with other real estate investors, but talking to the community and listening to what their needs were to say, how can I help? And it just became apparent that look at all the land, look at all the condemned houses, look at all the things that are opportunities for me to create that housing that has options and affordability with using the current stock that is right that I passed every single day on my ride to work and I never noticed before. So that's what I focus on. I I do the Real Estate Investor Association meetings in my county. And more and more, you hear real estate investors saying, oh, nothing's affordable. I can't find rehabs. I can't get a good deal, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm thinking, wow, I have so many options here. Do you want them? You know, think differently. Think outside of three bedroom, two bath, 1,500 square feet. And don't think big apartments. You know, just think the small things that are right available right in front of you. Give us some concrete examples of how we should think and how you have actually thought and the the projects that you've carried out or seen others carry out. When you listen to consumers that are end buyers, well, why do I need a living room? Why do I need a dining room? Why do I need 1500 square feet when I only listen to when I only live in 400? So I put that on my back burner and think, okay. Well, who is working on small scale, smaller, not only house, but small scale in the way of just say you have an old building. Can you convert the first floor to businesses and have the apartments on the top? And so I actually have taken land completely horrible to turn off old, you know, whether it's a a mobile and that's, of course, one solution that was used probably in the 70s or 80s, and now those mobiles are too old to live in. I've taken those out and converted them. I actually did a a project with shipping containers. Let's try that and converted them into, geez, they're 160 square feet. If you get a small one, a 20 foot or 320 for a large one, how do you, you know, make that available? And how many can you put on a land that you've just cleaned out? A lot of times real estate investors will look at when people die and then they leave or they go to the munition sales or the tax sales 
and they see that family members don't want the property, they don't want anything to do with it, so they let it go and they don't pay for it. How do you go to those people and say, you know what, instead of you losing your land, let me teach you how to put ADUs or, you know, a 500 square foot home on that and make that income producing for your family. And so generational wealth, you can build that. How can you refocus your brain into how can I solve problems for a community that makes everyone prosperous? And so the tiny house communities, you know, you can set that up like a regular community, townhouse, tiny houses. I haven't done this one on my own, but someone else has student housing. Think about how much student housing is and what if you can do buy a house and just recreate it into several small apartments for housing for students near a university. And a lot of it has to come down with what holds me up are the work that you have to do on the four, the four to get those ordinance changed, whether it's density or height restriction or land use or building codes. Those are the things that are the hard things. Anybody can be taught to put a small house in their backyard. And then there's so many loan opportunities for owners, homeowners, to create their houses into something else and to use their land for something else. Michelle, you just touched on kind of the next area I wanted to get into, which is policy at the the local government level, the state level. You know, a lot of density has been zoned out of our housing in the past 50 years. You, You used to see a lot of that missing middle, the three units, the four units. It's been zoned out. Now there's a push in in many areas to bring that back, but it takes a lot of education on the part of the leaders who are making the policy. And then it also requires a lot of pushback on the nimbyism. And then for those who don't know what that is, it's not in my backyard. The neighbors who don't want the ADU next door or the three unit to be built next to their single family home. Let's take it one at a time. How do you educate and work with the leaders in order to change the policy? Sometimes leaders are NIMBYs too. And that's where I started. I actually started with county council because they were the people that were, you have access to those folks and they are more willing to sit down and listen to you. So I'll answer that question two ways. One is you have to educate on NIMBYism because if people, if you don't want them in your backyard, you know, whatever homelessness or affordable housing or whatever word they use, because they don't know which word to use, if you don't have it in your, their, if they don't want it in their backyard, they're certainly going to have it in their front yard and they have to address it. So we have a housing group in our county and really we work with a lot of different agencies. It's all volunteer. It's just an ad hoc collaborative collaboration. And it really all boiled down to the elected officials and the policymakers. How can you help them see that they're helping their constituents solve a, for you to solve their problem? Because that's in fact what you work for is your constituents. And it's really teaching them not only the statistics. And I realized that along the way, you can talk all this emotion thing about homelessness and, and the horrible city conditions. But until they have statistics that say, you know, in your account, in your district, did you know that 60 percent of people can't afford housing? And this is my data. It's an eye opener to them. Whereas if you talk to home advocacy people, they're going to be very emotional. So me, not only as a as a researcher, but also as somebody that is very qualitative, quantitative. I want data to be able to support what I'm saying. So that's how I address the policymakers as far as your individuals that, well, if I put a housing unit here, it's going to block my view. It's understanding what is in their mind and how to shift that to see that they can solve a problem together. They might not want a three level. Maybe what about a two level? What about something that's going to put in jobs in that area, et cetera? And so really involving them in the solution process to get them away from their nimbyism. 
I mean, that's a whole nother conversation. There's ways to start YIMBY campaigns and it's all, they, they all have the same basic components, but it's really diving into the community to see what creates community nimbyism to create, to change that attitude. Yeah. I love what you just said, Michelle, about using data and having the data to educate the, the leaders. But let's dig into the nimbyism a little bit more because eventually there's going to be a public hearing at the you know the planning commission or the city commission or wherever. And that's where the NIMBY show up with the pitchforks and they fill the room and they basically exert a lot of pressure on those elected leaders to vote against any type of density. How do you address that? So the people that show up in those meetings are not the people who need the housing. And only about 15% of them are anti-development, but they scream the loudest. And when you have those meetings, when do you have it? During the day, when the people that need the housing are all employed, they're all working, and they can't show up. Is there another way that we can have those hearings so that the entire community is heard? And that was an eye opener for me because I I look around and I see that person's not going to live in that house. What's the problem? And they don't understand that they will be affected one way or another. If it's not in your backyard, it's in your front yard. So shifting when those meetings are and being For the community members that need the housing, let them be there to have their voices heard. And a lot of times they don't understand what to say at these meetings. They want to talk about their kids not having shoes. No, no, no. Talk about the impact it has on their finances and on the economy. That's really how I will train somebody that's going to go there, regular mom and pop, regular person that needs housing. There's the homeowners. And then, of course, there's the renters. So even they have different attitudes. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about the organizations you work with, how they might find out more about you and this issue and how they might get in touch with you? Along this journey, I realized there was a lot of factions. And so I began the nonprofit called COBA to connect, organize, build and advance healthy community development using small scale. And that is a not-for-profit. But And then along the lines, I realized that the community really has to be involved. And I went on a bike adventure with the Fuller Center, and I went from Nashville to Natchez Trace, Mississippi. And along the Natchez Trace, we stopped along communities and went into them and fix things for people. You know, it was all faith-based. Whether it's a roof to keep people in their house, whether it's a handicap ramp to keep people in the house, or whether it's a build because there was a hurricane that went through. And I said, wow, this is so impactful. It, it changes people's lives when they just have somebody to clean up their yard. So I went back to Delaware and I started the Fuller Center for Housing of Delaware. And what that does It's the same person that started Habitat started the Fuller Center. The difference is, is that the Fuller Center is, they're called partnerships. And it's asking the community to get involved and solve their problems so that we, the Fuller Center of Housing for Delaware, can provide the assistance, be it financial or manpower, to fix those things that you say needs fixed. What if you want a community garden? Okay, we're in there. So that's why I did both of them. One is more of a research, legislative policy, networking. And the other one is the Fuller Center, which is really a hands-on activity. And they can work together. And both of those organizations can coordinate and connect with other helping agencies to make bigger projects happen. The way to find out more about those or to get in touch with you? My website will go live here shortly. It's called DIRT, D-I-R-T, the number two keys, DIRT to keys. And really it's a methodology for finding DIRT. How do you work through the process so that you hand keys to the ultimate owner or renter? So it's that process. So it's dirttokeys.com. And our audience, they're rental property owners, real estate investors. What is your final message to them? Start to look at your rentals 
And how can you take that 1800 square foot and reconfigure it or convert it? Or if you're going to upgrade it anyway, because the last renter trashed it, how can you double your, your money by doubling your vacancy, you know, the people that you can house in that property? So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is you don't really have to make a killing. It's just that little bit that people need. It's hand ups that people want, not handouts, especially the people that have employment. They just want a hand up. So think about that. I love your message, Michelle. I really appreciate you coming on the show to talk about the need for more housing density, affordable housing, not confusing affordable housing with homelessness like I did in the beginning, but really focusing on those who are part, I think you called it the Alice population. Thank you for sharing the solutions with us today. It's been a real pleasure. Great. Thank you for having me, Brian. Thank you so much. I'm so looking forward to having so many people in my real estate world that are finding a solution. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. And you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com. And you can also ask questions and join us on Facebook by going to RPOA, Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review.